Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this evening to talk more about COVID-19. Uh, I know if you're like me, you have great COVID-19 fatigue. But unfortunately, despite how we feel about it, it tends to continue to make itself known. So I'm once again, I'm very pleased to be joined by Sue Powers, public health manager and uh, health officer. Did I get that right? You got it perfect. Oh, thank you, Dr. Heiss. See, Heis. it's only taken almost a year. <laughs> Welcome, Sue. Thank you. And so, thank you to Door County Medical Center, as always, for hosting these. Really appreciate it. Well, what people don't know is that Sue and I work together, um, you know, fairly frequently. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I really enjoy your company. So it's, it's kind of nice to, to be able to see you. And I know it's been really tough. It's been tough going for, for, for you guys. It has been yeah, for everyone. For everyone. So what we thought we'd do is kind of go over some points, some pieces of information, uh, and then leave plenty of room for, for questions. So this will we'll take this about an hour um, uh, if, we, if we have enough questions uh, to go that long. But I guess what I wanted to start with is, um, uh, Sue, do you want to give us kind of an update on where we are? And I can, you know, I've got some of my numbers, you've got some numbers, and we'll kind sure. of chat about that. Sure. I think everybody's aware there's been a big surge in cases in the last few weeks. And actually, since September 1st, we have had 218 cases, so we've more than doubled our cases. As of this morning, the state put us at 340 cases cumulatively. I'm quite sure we have more than that um, at this point. And it is not just Door County, of course. It is across the state. Um, the highest number of positives in a single day was last Saturday, and they had four days of over 2,000. Um, statewide, 18 to 24-year-olds are the biggest group, but that is not exactly true here, and I think Dr. Yeah. Hayes has some of those stats. And I know, is that, do you want me to go through that, or do you have sure. other things? Sure, yeah. nope. So the, I know in past, and when I, when I talk to people, I get that question a lot. What's the, what's the main age bracket? And, and uh, our IT guys were able to run that for me. And uh, so as the largest percentage of uh, positives that we've had is at 43%, age 30, 31 to 59. That's our biggest percentage, followed by greater than 60 years old, which makes sense because we tend to have an older demographic here in Door County followed by 21% uh, of, of 18 to 30 year olds. So that's the, that's the age bracket where we're seeing high numbers elsewhere in the state. A lot of times I think because of college campuses and things like that. So that's, a, that's our third highest. And then followed by 12 to 17, then six to 11, then zero to five. So we've had 2.4% zero to five years old. So um, it still remains kind of the uh, middle age, you know, early middle age people that that uh, that are positive, and you know, one of the things that that uh, I have noticed and and uh, uh, is that I myself and and Dr. Amy Fogarty, we, we're calling all the positive tests that Door County Medical Center gets because we believe that they should that should be a phone call. So we're calling all those folks and everyone that I've talked to over the last eight weeks or so thankfully has had what I would characterize as a mild illness. And so my definition of a mild illness as an example is um, some people will go from literally nothing, so no illness at all, completely asymptomatic, um, and they were tested because they were a close contact, to people that um, I think the worst I've heard is, you know, horrible, horrible body aches, terrible fatigue, they're sleeping 22 out of 24 hours, maybe have a fever. Um, but we've had very few that have required hospitalization. Unfortunately, though, that's a tick up, an uptick as well right now. We now have two people in the hospital. We had three um, over the weekend. So uh, um, that's, that represents a, a significant uptick for us, even though the number is low, uh, because we had gone for, gosh, I, three, four months without anyone in the hospital. So um, uh, that, 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 that's a factor as well. Um, so we talked about the age distribution. So, but Sue, in, in your discussions with, with folks you've spoken to on your staff, mm -hmm. are there any common themes as to the positive cases? What are you seeing? Sure. We're seeing cases resulting from a variety of different situations that involve group gatherings. And that's, you know, more people moving about the community and gatherings. So parties, 
reunions, weddings, family gatherings, places of work, and we're starting to see the K through 12 schools also. Um, and before, when you were mentioning hospitalizations, um, across Wisconsin, um, we logged the highest number of people hospitalized in Wisconsin last Thursday um, with coronavirus since the pandemic began. So that's a trend statewide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And um, let's see. Um, I know that uh, I'm looking at my notes because I don't have the memory power to remember all this in my head. I know that that. Uh, Public Health has just put out a, a press release today, so I wanted to spend sure. some time kind of going through that that information. So why don't you go go ahead and let's talk about that? Yeah, and it is because of the thank you. It is because of the significant uncontrolled spread of COVID nineteen in our community. And again, we are not unique here in Door County. We're seeing it across Northeast Wisconsin and across the state. Um, the number of cases continues to accelerate and exceeds the ability of our healthcare providers to provide testing and our ability to do case investigation and control to, spread, to control the spread of illness. Um, contact tracing is significantly strained. Our goal remains to reach out to all confirmed positive cases within 24 hours and at present we're several days behind on this. We have reached out to the state contact tracing team for assistance and they are also several days behind this goal. So at this time, we will no longer be calling those individuals who are close contacts of a positive case. And we are asking for help from the community, the community as a whole. Um, if you test positive, we ask you to do the following. Stay home and isolate for a minimum of 10 days after the onset of your symptoms. And if you did not have symptoms but were tested because you were a close contact, uh, remain isolated for 10 days from the date of testing. Um, we ask you also to notify your employer. And we ask you to notify your close contacts um, because they should quarantine for 14 days. And in our press release, we have links to a couple different, well, actually three different flyers. Um, one is guidance for businesses. One is guidance for you as a, if you are a positive case. And one is guidance for those who would be close contacts and would need to quarantine. And I know this is a lot, um, but with, we simply do not have the capacity and we are not, um, we are many, one of many local health departments across the region and across the state following this um, type of model, asking our community to assist us with this. Okay. So we're starting to get some questions, but what I want to what I want to do, um, and I know I know uh, Sue can't see the comments. I know, but I, I think it probably is is just worth mentioning. I mean, I I, I know uh, Sally has sort of said, you know, this is unacceptable. We have to really mm -hmm. we have to you know get on top of this, and and I completely mm -hmm. understand what you're saying, Sally. I, I really do. Um, so I just wanted to. Just wanted to make sure that you understood that that we see this and we understand that. Um, so I, I have a comment. Okay, please. Uh, regarding yeah, yeah. that, just... that is um, exactly one of the reasons why we're going to this model. We were spending a lot of time um, with the contact tracing of positive cases, and this way it'll free us up to notify those positive cases immediately or, or sooner, hopefully, um, hopefully within the 24 hours. Um, that they need to isolate and instruct them and all that and talk about who their contacts might be and ask them to get in touch with them as well as their employer. So it will also help us um, to be able to spend more time um, guiding employers in situations with positive cases at their workplace and um, answering questions that the school nurses have for us um, and, and guiding them also. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I want to get to some of these questions, and I want to talk about some of the things that, you know, as far as testing and things like that, so everyone in the community has a better idea of kind of what's going on. So Judy asked the question: Is the hospital and clinics are they going to be changing their policy for visitors because of the uptick? Um, 
our incident command has not taken that up yet. We did speak to, we, we met with our physicians today, and I think that is something we're going to be talking about uh, because I think that probably when it comes to the amount of community spread we're seeing in the community, we want to do our best to, to prevent spread. And, and one of the things I'm seeing is that um, people are positive and don't have any idea that they were, you know, so, uh, uh, and are completely asymptomatic. So, so that'll be something we have to, uh, we have to take into consideration. So now I'm just going to scroll here. I'm sorry for looking down, but I just want to try and manage our time. Um, are the schools going to be calling if a child is in close contact while in school? I believe the schools either call or they send a letter. Um, I, I just will, I, I will state that my son was a close contact and uh, we found out from um, the school. Um, it was, uh, I think it was an email. Um, uh, and I actually, my, we got a phone call as well. So, uh, um, and I know Dr. Fogarty is, is calling all those positives when kids are positive. So um, we're working through that. You know, the big thing with all of this is um, uh, just pure numbers of, of people. You know, I think this is one of those things where, and this is not, none of this is meant to be an excuse. It's my my uh, desire and intention is just to try and kind of explain what, what's, what's behind, what do we do when we have all these positives. And a lot of it just has to do with the number of people that it takes to, to deal with this. And, you know, when the CDC comes out with, with guidelines that say, well, a co close contact is defined as if you're within six feet for 15 minutes at a time or for the entire day that you are a close contact, that can tend to, that can broaden the scope of what is a close contact pretty quickly. And I'll tell you, as having been a close contact, that's what you don't want to be because that's where you have 14 day minimum quarantine. So if there's any, any good reason to try and stay away from people that you can, like going to the store and things, it's a good reason to do it. And I, I learned firsthand about why I want to do that. Uh, let me see. Someone said Door County numbers are at 1700. No, that's not true. I think our total is about um, 350 or thereabouts right now. Mm -hmm. And it depends on if it's, if it's the public health department for Door County or if what, what I'm reporting, because we also test quite a few people in Kiwanee County and also people from out of state. So our number actually is 371. That includes those people that are out of the county, out of state, and that also includes um, people that have been tested more than once. And those are the type, and why would you be tested more than once? You'd be tested more than once if you're trying to donate convalescent plasma and then you would you'd be tested again, um, which we're not seeing as much. Um, right. Have and any of our cases been sent to Green Bay? No. Uh, let's see. Let me just... Uh, Concern with people getting tested too soon after exposure and possibly getting false negatives. It seems these people um, do not know what, that whatever their results are, they should still isolate. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that, that, the, that guideline? Sure. If you have been in contact with someone with COVID, the best time to get tested is after seven days from your last contact, seven to 14 days. And even if you test negative, will be asking you to quarantine for the full 14 days because that is what is science tells us at present is the incubation period. So from day of exposure up to 14 days, you could develop symptoms or replicate the virus in your system enough to test positive. And uh, another question sort of in that vein Elizabeth asks, when an asymptomatic person has tested positive in the past, how long should that person wait before they retest? If they're, and I'm waiting for my questions to pop up again, there we go. If, uh, if their employers do routine testing, uh, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure what employers do routine testing because pretty much with the exception of a few at Aurora and a few, I think Bellin is starting to do a few, we're the only testing game in town and um, uh, we don't generally retest is the bottom line. And the reason that we don't retest is because it's possible to pick up dead virus for quite a long time. We know from our own personal experience with a patient or a, a, yeah, a patient who was positive, he had a desire to donate convalescent plasma and he tested positive for about three months, long after his symptoms were gone. And that doesn't happen in every case, but we don't know how long that test would be positive. There's many tests in medicine that we don't do what we call a test of cure. 
Um, and this is one of those times. You do a test of cure if it really makes a difference, um, if it's going to change how you manage the situation. In this case, we don't do a test of cure because it won't change how we manage the situation and also because we can't necessarily believe the result we get. Uh, let's see. Um, I see some questions about status of schools. I don't have specific information as to the schools as far as status. I mean, I know like, I can just, I can, I mean, my son's in eighth grade and they are virtual until Wednesday and it has to do with staff. Um, but I, I can't speak to, to others and so that, that would be information that um, I can. If a Door County resident going to school in Madison tests positive, is that a Door County positive or a Dane County positive? If they are residing in Dane County at the college, it is a Dane County resident. Um, same as if there was a seasonal visitor that is living here for the season and they test here, they are a Door County resident and they would be counted. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, so that's in our numbers for public health. And as Dr. Heiss said before, his numbers have to do with anyone they test in the county or out of the county. Uh, let's see. Okay. Kirsten, thank you for asking this question because this will, um, this will get to what I wanted. So why is, take, why is testing taking so long? By the time you get your results, other people have, other people have been infected. And with COVID cases on the rise, the drive-through testing site should be open on a Saturday, even though, okay, so I get that. So that's a really good question. And that's, and so why is testing taking so long? So um, right now we are, we, we do all the, t pretty much all the testing. I know Aurora is doing some antigen testing, which we'll hopefully talk about in a little bit. I think Bellin is doing some as well. Um, but I think the big thing to know is there's a high volume right now. Uh, we have instrumentation in house that can do uh, um, more quick turnaround testing, and we're doing that. Um, a lot of how we do the testing, and I could get into a lot of detail, which would bore everybody, but a lot of how we're able to do high numbers of testing has to do with what we call pooling of specimens. Putting a group of people together that we know are maybe low risk, and you pool the specimen, if the entire pooling is negative, you're good, everyone's negative. If, if it comes back positive, then you retest every one of those tests and you find out which one or which ones are positive. When we can pool, we can turn around a lot of tests quickly. Being able to pool has to do completely with the percent positivity. So what percentage of people that we test are positive? Over the last two weeks, uh, uh, literally a, uh, a quarter of pe pe the people that are tested have been positive. So that's a 25% positivity rate. You can't pool in those situations. And so when that happens, the turnaround time lengthens. What we sometimes need to do, because the instrument is, is um, a finite machine, shall we say, we will send some tests out to Exact Sciences Lab, which is in Madison. That turnaround time is about three to five days, sometimes even longer, because they're getting tests from everywhere. Um, and so that's why it's longer. And I know last weekend was especially, or weekend before last, was especially frustrating because we had a bunch of tests that were taking five days or even seven days to come back. And your comment is spot on as far as it's really frustrating and it's annoying because I look at it as if I can't get a result of somebody in three days, I, I really feel that. And I, I know how I'd feel if I were tested. So, you know, we're working through that. There, there had been a rumor earlier in the week that we weren't doing any testing. That's never true. We have multiple ways to perform testing and we will continue to do that. Um, so unfortunately, testing continues to be a, I don't want to say a scarce resource, but I guess in some sense it is a scarce resource. These companies that provide us with the equipment, they actually are on allocation. So I, I sort of use the, the analogy that if I was going to write out a check for whatever amount of money and say, I want to buy 10,000 tests from you so that I can do 10,000 tests, um, they would say, okay, thank you very much. Here's 32. <laughs> and that's kind of what it is because they're allocating because we're not the only person. There's, there's a bunch of commercial labs, but everyone is sort of in the same boat. Um, and there's a lot of other subtleties that are in there. I used uh, an analogy, and you tell me if this is worth anything. I used the analogy. I thought about it and thought, you know, most of us have used a Keurig coffee maker with the K-cup. And it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to put my K-cup in the Keurig and I'm going to close it and I'm going to hit go. We know how, what the time, the turnaround time 
of doing that is. It's not as quick as taking a, a brewed cup of coffee, pouring it, and handing it to the next person. So if I've got a line of 55 people with their individual K-cup and one machine, that's kind of what it's like, which you then might retort, well, why don't you buy more machines? Again, allocation. Mm. So, so we're working through that. We are getting new instrumentation, new modalities of testing. So, you know, like, like so many things in this, we're li literally learning as we go. So again, I don't say that any of that as excuse. It's just, uh, you know, I, I so want for people to understand uh, sort of why we do the things we do and, and what's the reasoning behind it. And I think I want to go back to the beginning of that question. Yeah. Um, the, the person said something about, you know, if you don't find out, then people are infecting others. Optimally, anybody who has COVID-like symptoms should be staying home and isolating um, until they get, get a negative test result or until 10 days have passed and they're symptom-free. Um, Annette is questioning my math, I think. Um, uh, it's, uh, it has to do with, believe me, I'm, I'm confused as the heck out of me too. It has to do with a 14 day positivity rate versus like today, the single day positivity rate is 5.68%. So there's a, there's a difference, um, in how this is done. Um, Tracy has a really good question and I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. Why don't you have the new Abbott labs test equipment an instant 15 minute test results that Trump is always bragging about. Well, again, this, this kind of goes into the whole, what we're doing right now is, is a, um, a, uh, 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 basically a genetic test called PCR. PCR takes genetic material, the, vi the virus RNA, and it actually picks it up if it's there and it amplifies it and it says, hey, look, it's positive. Um, the Abbott test, at least one of the Abbott tests, because you have to remember there's, there's a large number of different test modalities that are out there testing devices and ways of testing is a test called an antigen test. What that's looking for, an antigen basically is the, the disease, is, is the virus that we pick up. So it picks up that antigen. The, and that's a very quick test. We will be actually getting that in-house in the next number of weeks. It's not as simple as why don't you get that test and just test yes or no. What we want to do whenever we test, we want to make sure that the test result means something and that it's predictive of true disease. So the antigen test is, is a really good test if a person has blatant symptoms, if they have terrible body aches, if they have fever, if they're coughing, and then you do the antigen, the, the spit test as we call it, and it comes back in 15 minutes as positive, you then understand that, yeah, that's positive. However, if someone's asymptomatic, it's difficult to believe the test. What, what does it mean? And the science right now recommends uh, backing that test up with a PCR test. So you can see that it doesn't necessarily help as far as getting things done quicker. Um, so we will have that, but it's, it's, it's sort of an incomplete solution, I would say. But it certainly is an additional, an additional uh, uh, way that we, we can try and get through some testing. Let's see. Have you learned any more about long-term health effects? Um, there's a little bit, there, there's some data out there that suggests that especially kids can develop what's called a, a cardiomyopathy, which basically is a, a heart muscle that's an, uh, affected by um, uh, the virus itself. We see that with other viruses as well. Um, but I think all this is really too soon. I think we're, this is going to be uh, a situation where we have a really large postmortem, which is an autopsy, a really large autopsy when this is all done to look back and say, okay, what did we learn? What can we say for sure? As you see when you're on the internet, there's all kinds of People will throw out memes, they'll try and, and, and throw out causation versus correlation versus causation, things like that. And the reality is sort of the endeavor of science is we need to be able to test things and the testing has to hold up and repeat testing. So if I say that X leads to Y, it has to independently, X always has to lead to Y if 150 people do that test as opposed to, well, I did it once, therefore it must be true. Um, Let's see. I'm talking too much. You've got to talk You're more. doing great. Oh, <clears throat> let's see. Thank you, everybody, for putting up with my drivel. You're getting some good questions tonight. Yeah, and I, 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 it, I tell you what's interesting is when you do this, trying to get the, the questions to appear on the screen and being able to scroll in a way that I can <laughs> look at is, is surprisingly challenging. Let's see. I'm just looking, I'm sorry for the, the silence. 
You want to do a you, Sue? Why don't I, I you talk could, about getting a flu shot? How I was going to say I could do a commercial for getting a flu shot. So, not only are we having the surge in COVID cases, we're coming into flu season. Um, it, respiratory viruses, of which COVID is, um, most respiratory viruses peak in Wisconsin between late fall and early spring. So, we're coming into flu season. We want to encourage you to get a seasonal flu vaccine um, as soon as possible, and not only to protect you from getting both illnesses at once, um, but fewer people who get the flu in Wisconsin, the stronger the COVID response can be. Um, I know at Door County Public Health, we have a press release coming out, hopefully within the next couple of days, talking about um, our drive-through flu vaccine clinics um, that will have um, in Sturgeon Bay, as well as Northern Door and Southern Door, and of course on Washington Island. And I know that Door County Medical Center has put out a press release and has their clinics um, all scheduled also. Okay. Um, public health site doesn't seem to show posted cases today. How many added since last Friday? I can tell you at least from our testing site, because I did a lot of phone calls over the weekend. We had 25 positives Friday, 10 Saturday, 8 Sunday, and about 13, I think, today. So just to give you an idea of, of uh, where we are. Right. Someone had asked a question about flying. Um, is it safe to fly? And I think one of the things throughout all of this is, you know, I, I think we in general don't... Um, you, I think we don't know how to balance risk very well. I think there's... With anything, there's risk. And so I think it has to be, you know, how, how much risk are we willing to take? I'll tell you, I was on an airplane uh, in July. Um, I went to uh, Estes Park, Colorado, and, you know, we, we flew, not a uh, unabashed commercial for Delta, but we flew Delta, and everyone is required to mask, and they, they leave the middle seat empty. And, I, and, and we did fine, and I really, I really um, uh, you know, I... I, I is it safe? I mean, I think it's as safe as it can possibly be. I mean, is there a risk? There's always a risk. So I think, you know, if you, I think what, what a lot of this comes down to with COVID is if you are in a high risk group, if you have a lot of medical comorbidities, which is to say, let's say you've got diabetes and you've got high blood pressure and you've got emphysema, that's when you're going to want to be extra careful. Um, so the risk you're willing to take um, has to weigh in. Someone also, I think, asked on here about quarantining. Should you quarantine for 14 days after you get back? There's no, there's no um, particular dictum that says you need to quarantine when you come back. It was for a while. I mm -hmm. think certain states were saying when you get into their states, you've got to quarantine for, for 14 days or whatever, but there's, there's really none. For, That's for because us. we're at this high rate of, of yeah. COVID. Okay. And that was a really good point about risks. So everything we do comes with some risk. And... The more people you interact with, uh, the higher the risk, really. Yeah. Um, here's a question related to so many restaurant closures. Do we see a large increase in workers getting infected? Um, what's the percentage of the new cases? Are these frontline workers? That I, I, that I certainly, I, I don't know that. I mean, I'm sure I could get that. But um, I think the big thing to know, I guess, if anything, that I would say is, you know, when, when businesses close, it's not... And you correct me, Sue, if I'm wrong. Okay. The the uh, we public health does not tell businesses to close because there's a positive case. I think the the reality is is that when one person at work tests positive, if, if they had been at work, they may have a close contact or two, and that puts a person out for 14 days. And so I think more than anything, those closures happen as a result of lack of staffing. Um, so it's not that a business must close. Um, so. You're correct. Okay. To date, we have not asked any business to close due to COVID. We have asked them to comply with guidelines and masking and distancing and all of that. And we have worked with them on next steps when they have an employee test positive. I can say, and this is not an exact number, but it's really a small percentage of those frontline workers that comprise our cases. Um, more of the cases are just general community movement in gatherings and reunions and weddings and, and that type of thing. Um, I also want to add that if there was a risk to the community, a continuing risk, 
to have a business open, we would certainly ask them to close and, and we would certainly make sure that happened if there was a continuing risk to the public. Um, and Heidi asked the question about, I was able to get a test last week at Aurora and I got them back in 30 minutes. That's the antigen test that we just talked about. Um, so yes, that, that's certainly an option. Um, let's see. Bellin is reporting 150 of their nurses or staff with COVID are in quarantine. They're getting short staff. Nurses are working extra hours. Do we have any? Um, I, I don't believe we do at the moment, um, but I, I do know that all of us are uh, literally at our staffing maximum as far as um, you know, the, the running the testing site, um, trying to do flu clinics along with that. It all takes people and, and uh, so, so I think everyone is doing the best they can with the staff that they have, but that's always a concern. Um, so we aren't being asked per se to limit travel. I thought we were supposed to be trying to stay home. I, I'm, I'm gonna answer this, but then you can. I mean, okay. I would say, I think we stopped saying stay home a while ago, because I think the reality is we need to figure out a way to live with this virus on the short run. So I think that's where I guess I've been trying to stress mostly is, you know, if you're gonna go to Walmart or if you're gonna go somewhere, you know, wear a mask when you go there, wash your hands when you're done, try and distance from the person close to you. Um, but you can kind of go about your business. And I think if you do that, I think you're gonna do very well. Um, I really have not limited, you know, going to, uh, I did initially, you know, when, when everything was closed, but you know, I've gone to Costco and things like that. And, and so I think it's just being smart about it. And I know I keep using that phrase, be smart about it. And that's my definition is when you go out, wear a mask. Because I think one of the things we know to be true, if nothing else, with all the debates about masking, should we have it or should we not, I am really convinced, and it makes complete sense from a science, the science behind virology is, even if virus gets through this mask, um, the amount that's gonna get through is gonna be significantly lower than if you didn't have a mask on, especially if the person with whom you're, you're interacting has a mask on as well. So even if it doesn't 100% uh, prevent it, you will uh, not get as much. And we know to be true that if you get a less dose, they call it the inoculum, if you get a lower inoculum of virus, you're not gonna get as sick. So, so, so the answer, that's a long-winded answer to are we being told not to travel. Again, it has to do with risk. You can travel, but make sure that you understand the risk of, of getting on an airplane. Make sure that when you're on that airplane, you wear a mask, you wash your hands. Sue, how would you respond to that? Well, similar, but a little more on the discouraging travel okay. because that does increase the risk for the whole community. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of questions at public health, something like, I'm from Arizona, but I wanna come to Door County for a vacation. Is it safe? Well, that is a really, I mean, we can't answer that, answer that question. It depends on, um, as Dr. Heiss said, your personal health, whether you have co comorbidities and how are you getting here? Are you flying? Um, are you driving? Where are you stopping? How are you conducting yourself? Are you wearing a mask? Are you keeping six feet away from people? Um, all of that. And, you know, in general, the more you're out and expose yourself to others, the more risky it is. Let's see. I'm, I'm reading through questions. There's a lot of really good ones, and I'm just trying to find some similarities so that I can answer a bunch at once. Um, uh, Kelly asks, is it possible um, to know more about how the virus is spreading? It'd be nice to understand what people are doing to understand how it's spreading. I think Sue alluded to that earlier uh, when we began this, which is it seems to be when people are getting into groups, you know, either family reunions or weddings, things like that. And, you know, we all understand people plan weddings a long ways out and nobody expected this to happen. And I certainly, I, not, not speaking from the public health perspective, I wouldn't say don't do your wedding, but I would say you can't then say, well, I, we're, none of us are going to wear masks and we're going to all hug and all that sort of thing. That's how you get sick. And that, we've seen that directly. Um, so I think that's kind of how it spread. I mean, it still remains a droplet spread is the big thing. I think that's really the, the chief thing. You know, we're starting as time goes on, there's case reports that are indicating that the eyes are probably less of a point of entry than the nose and the mouth. You've got two big sets of holes right here and that's where the virus tends to go. Um, 
So, and I think community spread is, is, is pretty rampant. And so I think even people that wear masks, as I mentioned a minute ago, you can still get it, but you get it less. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, at least for me, one of the probably frustrations for people that are testing positive that feel fine. And so what do you mean? I'm, I feel fine. Um, and these tests are very sensitive. There's, there's, there was an interesting article in the New York Times about um, how maybe the test, that these PCR tests are picking up um, virus at such a low level that it may be um, not even infective at that time, at that point, or not even, you may not be contagious because the number of virus is so low. Problem with that though is we're in the middle of a pandemic and if you have it, you have it. The point is really good as far as maybe the, the maybe we're, it's amplifying it so much that it might be a meaningless test. The problem with the tests, again, is what we know to this date, they're a PCR test. So it's a yes, no, it's an up, down. Do you have it, do you not? There's no gray, gray area, there's no um, finesse in there to say, well, you only have a little bit, so you're probably not gonna be all that infectious. We may get there, I mean, if we're still stuck with this, we may get there in, over the course of six, nine, 12 months, where we can say, yeah, you're positive. It's like HIV, we can, we can get a, a, a viral load for HIV. So it's not that you either have it or you don't, it's do you have what we call subclinical disease, which means disease that's there but isn't necessarily going to cause you problems at the moment, so you're keeping it at bay. So I'm babbling again. No, well that goes back to what we discussed earlier, that you can remain positive for up to about three months. Yeah. Um, and you know, we believe and science tells us that you're no longer infectious after your symptoms resolve and you're at least 10 days out from um, the symptom onset or from your date of testing. So would you say that there's been confirmed community spread at public schools? Are we able to say that? I mean, there has been some spread at public schools. Um, it's not, I mean, I don't want anybody to say, oh my God, it's rampant at the public schools. No, no there have been cases where, where it was spread at school. And, you know, I, I really want to stress, and I've been saying this for several weeks, when you go out in public, at this point, we all need to expect that we're going to encounter COVID and then adjust our behaviors accordingly to avoid contact with it. Yeah, someone just, I, I, I feel the need to, so now we're comparing COVID to HIV. Well, listen to the point that I made, which is, again, we're talking about the testing situation, how we can test for it. Right now we can say yes, no with COVID, with HIV and with hepatitis and other viruses, we can actually give a little better nuance to the, to the test. So that's all I'm talking about. I can see how politicians get in trouble. It doesn't take much. <laughs> um, let me see, there was a good question that I, that I saw and I wanted to hit upon. Um, I'm, again, I'm sorry for the dead air, folks. I'm just trying to, to look through. Um, someone says, is it a high risk to eat indoors at restaurants? Well, again, there's that risk thing. I mean, is the risk, uh, is the risk zero? No. Um, you know, again, I think all this has to do with relative risk. It has to do with how, how prone would you be to becoming, to getting bad effects of this illness? Right. So. And, and also how well ventilated is that restaurant? How far away are you from the next table? Um, all of that. Yeah. Claudette asked the question, I stated the cases are mild. Do I think it's because people are masking? I, I really do think that. I mean, and again, other than just Gestalt, I have no other, you know, because I do think people are, are masking. I think there's always, I think we're always going to have that that group, it's like, it's like anything else in all of the world. There's a, there's, there's, we call it the 80, 20 rule. Um, and I think, you know, there's a discussion of if 80% of people would mask, we, the other 20% that just flat out refuse to mask could go about and do their thing. And we would have enough, uh, collective protection. Um, so I, I do think it, it, it does because I don't have any other, uh, good explanation other than maybe some mutation of the virus to, to explain why, our cases up here have been mild. But I know, I always say that and I always feel very, whenever I say it, I sort of feel superstitious like the shoe's going to drop because look at Green Bay right now. They all of a sudden have had not only an uptick in cases, but they've had a significant uptick in hospitalizations. And 
that's, that's the difficulty is you don't know when all of a sudden this is going to turn out to be uh, very deadly. Let's see. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about schools as far as you know wh when they should close or not close and and that sort of thing. And I, I guess I, I'm not avoiding those questions. I just I don't know that I have the knowledge to answer those questions. Do you do you want to hear one? Well, I can talk a little bit to that. Yeah, why don't you do that? To those questions, I don't. There is no. Um, black and white in when schools should close and when they should stay open. And what public health has been doing is working with the schools. Um, by state statute, if there's a communicable disease situation and the health officer thinks that a school should close, we can do that. Um, I would like really not to do that. I would like to have the conversation with the schools. And so we've been meeting every week and we're in, in really close contact as to what's happening. In each school, we provide them with some data, uh, many of the things that we discussed here earlier. Um, and we are working with them when they have positive cases, guiding their um, who they consider close contacts, when they have questions about that. Um, to be clear, the schools are doing their own contact tracing, determining who was close contacts, but um, were, were their consultant in that. Right. And they are sending out the letters. So, and there are certainly concerns. Um, but there's also another kind of risk when you close a school. There's, there's other risks for children and, and society and parents not being able to work. So it's a, it's a really tough balance right now. Yeah. Um, Jean asks, um, uh, she was commenting to what I had said, I don't see how you can say just to live like normal but wear masks and wash hands. What about distance between people and concentrations of people? That's spot on. I think, I think you, you hit it. I mean, absolutely, that's part of it. There's the big triumvirate, the big three, wearing a mask, physical distance, six feet away or more, preferably, and washing your hands fairly frequently. So you mentioned with concentrations of people. That's absolutely right. Um, that's when we've, there, there's no doubt and there's no question that that's when we see higher percentages of, of, of cases is when people are in large groups close together. So, you know, out of anything that, you know, here in Wisconsin, you know, we're one of the drunkest states in the country, if not the drunkest state in the, in the country. I mean, going to bars, I mean, that's just, you might as well just sort of say, you know, hey, just come at me because that's kind of what you're doing. Um, so you're exactly right, Gene. I appreciate that, the ability to clarify that. Uh, let's see. Can a cat, pet catch the virus? I don't think that that can. I, 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 to be honest, I haven't been spending any time thinking about that. Um, yeah, uh, early on in the pandemic, there was information about that they weren't sure about that, and I have not heard anything since. Yeah. And why does Kewanee County have such a high case rate? I, I don't know that. I don't know that answer. I know Kewanee and Brown County are really hit hard mm -hmm. uh, of late. Ty says, so just say it's community spread at school. Don't tiptoe, don't tiptoe around it. I didn't know you were tiptoeing, but... I didn't either. Yeah, but yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Um, here we go. Um, so Paul asks, and I'm going to try and understand this. With our rising cases, why can Door County not be considered to have an upward trend in activity level? I think it does. It is an upward. Trend. Maybe there's. Maybe you're seeing. A, uh, you're referencing the DHS seven-day average, courtesy of DHS. I, I think it stayed the same last week. Did it? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was high, and it's still high. Yeah. Um. Can someone who tested positive months ago be a viral carrier and still infect others even though they have antibodies and can't get sick themselves? We really haven't seen that uh, at this point. I mean, um, I, I believe there are case reports of, of people who have become reinfected. Um, that has a lot to do with, um, we don't really know what the immunity uh, uh, situation is, you know, when 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 you, uh, if you are, if you do become ill with COVID-19, 
and you recover, how long after that will you, do you have immunity? And, and there really is no firm science on that yet. Um, I think I've, I've heard some things bandied about, about 90 days, you're good. That may just be a guesstimate, but there's no, my, to my understanding, and I certainly would love to hear what, you, what your take is, there's really no good science yet. We're, we want to know that information very badly, but there's not enough information to know yet. Right. The, what the state tells us is that if you um, have COVID and recover, um, within that 90 days, if you are then in contact with an active case, you do not need to quarantine. So uh, that's the parameter they're using for now. Okay. And I agree there's not a lot of science and it would be great to know more. Let's see. Yeah, I know people are asking, is there a threshold at which point businesses will be asked to close? And I think people really want that answer, and I'm not sure there is. Is there a threshold? Well, I don't know. There isn't. But what I've noticed is that some businesses are closing for the season early, voluntarily, or just closing for a number of weeks, um, probably because they recognize there's a lot of risk. Um, Okay. Uh, Amanda, thank you for your question. Any reason why some of the tests were canceled last week? Yes, and this is one of those frustrations, and I'm sure the frustration I felt is nowhere near what you or those that had their tests canceled felt. What happens is um, the test is, is performed, and when it goes to exact sciences, it has to be actually put on dry ice to be shipped. It's shipped down to the, the Madison area. And apparently what happened in that case was that the, the lab indicated that the tests were not frozen on dry ice when in fact they were. So it was kind of a compounding error. So, but I, I can only imagine what you, what you felt, uh, how frustrating that is, because I know we were really frustrated by that and we weren't obviously directly impacted. So thank you for the question. Uh, Oh, and I didn't, before I had that question about someone asked if you could be a viral carrier, it, the, the virus doesn't generally just lay, lay around and wait. I mean, at least what we're seeing so far, that hasn't been its behavior. It tends to cause infection or it doesn't cause infection and then it tends to, to go away. So the virus is, the, the, entire, the entire reason that viruses exist is to replicate and to keep going. And so what it'll generally do is it'll, it'll get into somebody with the whole hope of, okay, now this person's infected, they're gonna go out, they're gonna cough, and they're gonna spread their germs to someone else, and it's gonna keep going. So after a certain amount of time, it will, it will, I think for lack of a better way of putting it, it'll die off. There's probably more nuance to it than that, but that's kind of the gist. Would you say that's true? <laughs> I'm just talking too much. I'm trying to get you to, uh, people. No, I, you covered it well. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Got about 10 more minutes to go. I've got, these are all really good questions, everyone. I th thank you so much. I'm just finding that it's, uh, I'm struggling tonight actually trying to, to keep up and, and find good questions. So if I'm not getting to yours, I apologize. You're out of practice. What's that? You're out of practice. Yeah, I guess this. I yes. am. I guess I am. Yep. Um, someone asked, and I can answer, someone asked, uh, as of today, how many tests are still pending? As of this morning, it was 94. Um, so I'm sure a bunch of those have come back um, since that time. And our pending test number is undoubtedly higher. Yeah. Um, because we have other providers factored in, plus we have to process those um, when they come back to us to yeah. get the correct number. And we're only human. We can only do so many in a day. Yeah. Um, how long is someone contagious for once they start experiencing symptoms? 10 days. 10 days. You can be contagious for two days before symptom onset, however. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that was a quiz. Well, I'm saying, so, yeah, I was just, <laughs> I, yeah. That's what the science is telling us now. Right. And we're counting on that that's correct. Um, 
Here's one that I can try and answer. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the COVID vaccine? I think we do know that there's a number of vaccines that are that are in the middle of phase two and three trials right now. Um, what I've heard is that we will probably have uh, some vaccines available um, as early as late November into December, maybe the first of the year. Um, the big thing, you know, people always ask questions because somehow this is always this virus has managed to come down to taking a side or to the politics of it, which has been a real frustration. And I think the one thing that I would, you know, if you see a virus, that's, not a virus, if you see a vaccine that's trying to be pushed through before the election, the big thing would be is has it completed phase three trials? If it has, then it's gone through its appropriate track and it's probably reasonable. If it has not, if you hear something that's gone through phase two and someone says, well, it's phase two, it's very promising, we're gonna go right to market, then I, would, I don't think I would take that vaccine if it were just a phase two. I think once it gets through phase three trials, I, I expect that, that uh, there will be reasonable. It sounds like um, the vaccines that I've been hearing most about are a two-step vaccine, so you'll get it You'll get the first dose and then, I don't know, a week or two later, you'll get a second dose. Um, and then, of course, the question all, everyone wants to know is, is this, a, is this a, uh, a, uh, a vaccine that, is it a permanent immunity type of a thing like um, measles? You get the vaccination and it's permanent. Um, and I don't think we know. I think the suspicion is it's very much like influenza, which is, you know, it's probably not going to, COVID's not going to go away, but it might mutate enough where that every year we may have to get it again. But again, I think we'll know more as time goes on. I do know that we know a heck of a lot more, even though to listen to me talk, you'd think we don't know much, but that's me, that's not the science. Um, it's, uh, I think we, we know a heck of a lot more now than we did when this whole thing first started, which is why I tend to be, maybe I sound a little more um, um, relaxed about things like, you know, go, go ahead and go out, but use a mask. Because I think if we, I think, it's very difficult to tell people for a year to stay put in their homes. I don't think that's, that's ever going to work. And there's too many other, you know, it's one of those things where the cure is worse than the disease. In talking about the vaccine, which we're certainly all looking forward to, I think we have to remember that it's not going to be an instant cure. We're probably still going to need to wear masks for quite a while and distance and, yeah. and all of that. And, and I mean, I'm, really ready to be done with that too. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. But you're exactly right. I mean, yeah. I, 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 you know, relatives and friends ask me all the time, you know, how long do you think we're going to be with a mask? I said, I think I really do believe well, masking the, what I've heard some other scientists call hygienic measures. So masking and distancing and hand washing, I think those are going to be with us until third quarter of 2021. Um, and it has to do with, in, in order to get enough people vaccinated to where the degree of, of immunity is is pervasive enough where um, it's it's uh, you know reasonable for people to go back to, to whatever normal is. Um, Judy asked the question. I think is a good one. Um, can the county board do anything to stop the large groups without masks that are happening in Northern Door? You know that that's a tough one. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I I would say. You know, I sit on the, the Health and Human Services Board and, and you know, my sense is everyone wants to do the best that they can, but it's like anything else. I think there's always uh, balancing, um, you know, you want people to be able to do what they're going to do and you hope that you can appeal to people's better nature. It doesn't always work that way. So I feel like I'm talking around that, that answer, but I guess I don't have a good answer, which is why I'm talking around it. And I'll add, I don't have a good answer either. Um, yeah. The health officer can write a health order. Um, I've asked um, my legal counsel, can I write it in advance of an event? And the answer is unclear. Um, and, you know, public health wants to educate and inform and motivate and ask your cooperation on these things. And, you know, we're less interested in in catching you at doing something wrong. Um, we're not a regulatory agency um, in that regard. Um, we want to promote, prevent, and protect um, and see everybody alive and well. Okay. Um, uh, Debbie asks, is this the only virus that causes an asymptomatic response? Not at all. Um, you know, I think many of us get uh, if you've ever had a cold 
which you know one of the one of the viruses behind the common cold is a coronavirus, but not this one. Um, it's one of the other four human coronaviruses that exist. And how many times have, have we gotten? We felt a cold coming on, and all of a sudden the next day it was gone. Um, that's that. It's the virus happens, and it's 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 taken care of by the body's immune system. There is uh, some really interesting. Um, immunology behind how the body works and there is this whole thing you may have read or heard called the T-cell response. There's, there's not just antibodies, there's also a T-cell response and, and um, the thinking is is that the T-cell response has some effectiveness on the basis of having been exposed to the common cold like the other four human coronaviruses. Obviously it's not complete because if it were we wouldn't be sitting here having these conversations. We would be you know going on with our lives but that may help contribute to some degree of herd immunity without um, uh, risking um, a lot of lives. You know, and that's one of the things that I struggle with too, is I, I uh, you know, the idea of herd immunity is kind of compelling, but it's sort of, yeah, and it goes back to the whole risk thing. When, when we talk about, you know, people will say, well, the colleges are a great experiment because you have a lot of kids going there and they're all gonna get sick. And uh, my question is kind of more of a philosophic question. How many, how many people are, is it okay that die from this? And, and I don't say that as, a, as a, an argument that we shouldn't have college or we shouldn't play football or we shouldn't do it. I don't say that as an argument for that, but it's an interesting thought experiment if you ask yourself the question. And you know, some people will, will maybe come at that question from the perspective of, well, you know, kids that age are far more likely to die of, of, of toxins, which would be alcohol poisoning, of, of trauma from accidents, things like that. That's true. So anyway, it's it just it's an interesting conversation if you really sort of think through it. I think we're gonna about call it quits. This has been this has been the most uh, um, this has been work. Hasn't it? <laughs> I, I I just I can't thank everyone watching enough for the for the wonderful questions that you that you've asked, and I'm so sorry that I haven't been able to get to to all of them. Um, I think what we're going to do is is plan on doing another one of these. Uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to look through the comments, and I'm going to see, you know, try and look for those themes um, that that uh, I undoubtedly missed, and uh, see if we can't uh, maybe address those in a, in in a, another Facebook Live in, in a couple of weeks. So, uh, um, you know, Sue, I said I wasn't going to ask the question, but I guess after all the things we've talked about, is there anything else you can think of that we should add before we wrap it up? Well, as we we're talking, I'm thinking about how. Um, we've sort of enlisted the entire community to be on the public health team, and it's inevitable. I mean, the pandemic is here, and we're, we're asking you to take part in this, and, and I know most of you did not want to be on the roster. Um, but, you know, as many of you um, carry out what, you know, we're asking and, and do wear a face covering, physical distance, and help us with contact tracing and isolate when you're ill, um, the better for all of us. So, and I want to thank everybody for helping. Yeah, and thanks Sue and your team for, for all they do. Uh, and I know for, for many that may, that, that may not be, the situation may not be what you'd like. Um, and I, I think we just have to go forward as, as we are and then hope for the best. So uh, in the meantime, I wish you all the best. I wish you all well. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to talking again in, in a couple of weeks time. Take care.